And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth, and with, with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take his rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do these signs. And Moses went to went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said unto Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men that are dead which sought for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons, and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, and I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And it came to pass by the way in the inn, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zephorah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at his feet, and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband art that thou art, because of the circumcision. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God, and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord, who had sent him, and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people. And when the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. What I'm talking about today, out of Exodus chapter 4, is 
God doesn't need me. God doesn't need me. And the answer to that question, really, it's, it's an affirmative. The reality is, is that, yeah, God doesn't need us. Or so it seemeth when you study the scriptures. But what God does is he calls men. He doesn't need, but he calls men and he empowers them. In Exodus chapter 4, you see not one, not two, but three signs, miracles offered unto a reluctant Moses. A Moses who was receiving the call of God, who'd already blundered the call of God and perhaps acting ahead of time or out of order in slaying an Egyptian, having to flee away and spend 40 years in the wilderness raising children, uh, having, having uh, being under his father-in-law Jethro when he should have perhaps been a leader at that time. But we find Moses reluctant to it, even at this time, as he's been through this cycle with God, to get behind the calling of God. They will not believe me, he said in verse 1. He said, and Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Immediately doubting that the people would believe the story that Moses had said. Behold, God hath called me. Behold, God hath sent me to do this work. We need to guard against the attitude that Moses is exhibiting here. We need to guard against that, you know, I'm not cut out for this job, or, or God doesn't need me for this work, or even if I was to get involved, nobody will believe me. God doesn't need me is what I'm talking about. And in verse 10 you find, after this plays out a little bit, that Moses continues to say, you know, um, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Here's another excuse he's going to bring up. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. He brings to God as God calls him to a work. You know God empowers people. He gave Moses miracles. Surely he can give Moses what he needs in order to get his message across. And that's what God is going to begin to explain to him. And the Lord said in verse 11 unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And yet Moses still, he's reluctant. He, he, doesn't, he wants to bring to God some sort of excuse as to why, you know, God, you don't need me. You don't need me for this work. And God actually gets angry with Moses, chides with him a bit, and says, you know what, I made your mouth. You know what, I called you for this work. You know what, I appointed to this. I can give sight to the blind. I can make the deaf to hear. I can make the dumb to speak. Well, what are you saying to me, Moses? I appointed you for this task. And as you read on, you'll find that Moses is appointed his brother, Aaron, to be the spokesman, to be the mouth in the whole situation. But as you continue through Exodus, you find that never plays out. Moses here just brought to God some sort of excuse, anything he could think of. I'm of slow speech. But you find every time after this that he steps before Pharaoh, Moses is the one doing the talking. Moses is the one speaking. He never used Aaron as the spokesman. Perhaps he just needed some encouragement. Perhaps he just needed some provocation. Perhaps he needed to actually step out and get involved before he could see the gifts of God come to pass and the enabling empowerment of God to come to pass. It seemed like it was easy for Moses to do the miracles, to do the signs. It seemed like it was harder for Moses to get behind the call, to use his mouth, to go and to preach. Verse 12, you see that it's clear that what God needed from Moses was, now therefore go. Now therefore go. And God gives us the same command when he says, go. He had told the world and preached the gospel to every creature. God needs us to simply obey. To simply take those first steps to go and to get on board with his plan. And that's what it, is, it means when we say trust and obey. That's what we do. We trust God and we step forward. We obey his calling to us. And he has the same calling. Don't get me. Don't, don't think you're, you're uh, exempt from this. He has the same calling for all of us. To go and to let him work in your life. If you're a saved, blood-bought child of the king and you haven't been raptured out of here yet, the reason is that there's work for you to do. You have to go and let God have his way with you. Turn to Acts chapter 17. We need to stop with this attitude that says, I'm only this, or I'm only that, or I couldn't possibly be used of God. God doesn't need me. What could he possibly need with me? Now we know that the Lord's hands aren't weak. The Lord's 
arms aren't short. We know that his power hasn't dimmed. We know that he's not restricted by anything. As it says in Revelation 19 and verse 6, as we will be saying unto him throughout all of eternity, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He hath all power. He hath everything he could need. There's nothing that God is lacking. He's not restricted by anything except for when he restricts himself by his own word. God is omnipotent. God is all powerful. And yet we find in Acts chapter 17 a statement that affirms that even more so. Acts chapter 17 and in verse 24 it says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hand, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Here the Apostle Paul steps into Athens, a place that was full of idol worship. They had a God of the harvest. They had a God of the stars. They had a God of the rain. They had gods for everything. And just in case they had forgotten one, they made up this other God called the unknown God. And Paul was wise as he stepped in to this situation. He says, I'm going to declare unto you this God that you ignorantly worship. The unknown God is the creator of all. And in his preaching to them, he says that God created the heaven and the earth, and he's not worshipped by his creation. He is not, he doesn't need that his creation should make little statues of him. He doesn't need that his creation should bow down to him. He doesn't need that his creation should, should give him anything, offer him anything. But God, because he had made everything, has in control over all things, though he has no need for them. He saw it fit to appoint his creation a simple duty, and to us is extended by a calling. He doesn't need us, but he calls us, and he has chosen each and every one of us for a particular work at a particular time as this. In 1 Peter 2.9 it says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And what that is speaking to is the fact that Christians, believers as a whole, are all of these things. We have been picked, we have been set above, we have been separated, and we are distinct from the world around us. We are chosen. We are royal. We are a holy nation unto him and a peculiar or a different, a separated people. We're special unto God. And while he doesn't need us to do anything for him because God lacks nothing, he does reach out to us with a calling. He has a goal. He has a particular desire. He has a particular calling for us as a church united and for each and every individual us. And while he may not need us, while he may not need anything to be for certain, surely it is nice to each and every one of us to know that he does want you. He has chosen you. He has called you. And he has even made you for a particular purpose. There is a particular thing that he needs and wants and desires of you. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Now after Psalms, and right in the middle of your Bible, you'll find Proverbs, okay, after that. And then you'll find Ecclesiastes. You'll find a big book of Isaiah. And then there's Jeremiah. And if you go to Ezekiel, you've gone too far. In the book of Jeremiah there in the Old Testament, God exemplifies this idea of a calling upon a particular person, okay? Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, there was particular care, there was a particular fear, a particular reverence when God made us and he made us wonderfully. Each and every one of us in particular. We are all special. I could just raise my hand and make foot or fingerprints on the wall. You could put yours beside them and see that they're completely unique. Every single one of us is unique. Every single one of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. Remember this next time. Remember that statement. Remember that in Psalm 139, that you are special. You are needed. You are required for a certain thing. 
God doesn't need anything from you, but he desired that you would be appointed a particular task. He has a special place for you. So next time you do feel down, don't think that God doesn't need you. Don't think that God wants nothing to do with you. We need to buck up. We need to cheer up. We need to understand that God wants you, and that's even better. God doesn't need something from us, but God, out of the abundance of all that he has, has a particular want, a particular reason for each and every one of us. And it's a good reason. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says all things work together for good. We know this. We know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose. And that's each and every one of you under the sound of my voice today. You are the called according to his purpose. And we don't need to falter from that. We need to grab a hold of that and say, hey, there's a purpose. And though things don't seem to be going my way at this particular time, God has a big purpose for me, and he's working all of these circumstances in my life together for good. I need to love him, and I need to follow him. I need to go where he wants me to go, and not to back down from that calling, not to step aside from that calling, not to think that I'm insignificant. God has the best in mind for each and every one of us, and we need to be reminded of that. In Jeremiah chapter 1, in verse 4, And then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Isn't that interesting? He's talking to the prophet Jeremiah. He's, he's beginning the call upon his life to bring him into the ministry, to bring him to write one of the largest portions of Scripture in the whole of the Bible. He's about to kick off the career, if you would, of this great preacher who's going to stand before the entire world, if you read, and preach to everybody. Literally, he went from nation to nation to nation to nation. He was the first jet-set preacher. He was just traveling all over the place, making sure that the word of the Lord, and it was in his day, was heard by all nations. And here he says, Before I formed thee, God says of Jeremiah, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. That means he set him apart. That means he had a particular plan for him. He was different. He was choice. He was set apart among many. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And this is all before he was even formed in the belly. This is all before anyone could even go in there and microscopically know that there was a child conceived. Even before Jeremiah's mother had any inkling that there would have been a child conceived. God already had a particular plan and a particular call for Jeremiah. And yet Jeremiah here, with understanding all of that, hearing the statement that just came from God that, hey, God has a plan for you, he makes this statement, which we often would do the same thing. Then said I... O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. He comes with excuse. He comes with reasons uh, why he can't fulfill the call of God in his life. God would give a man like Moses miracles to maybe encourage him, to strengthen him. God would give a man like Jeremiah the story of his life even before he was a speck, even before he was conceived in the mother's womb as a sign that, hey, I know you and I know the plans I have for your life. I know the thoughts that I have towards you. And he says, oh, Lord God, I can't. I cannot. God, you don't need me. We need to understand something. As this continues on, the Lord is going to start to work with Jeremiah to bring him in line with his plan. And this is what God wants to do with us. He would prefer that we wouldn't come back to him with excuses, of course. But he understands our frailty. He understands our frame. He knows our weaknesses. And so God comes back to the prophet and says, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And Whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. He immediately addresses the actual problem that Jeremiah had. He says, I'm a child, I cannot speak. And he says, hey, don't say that. Don't say that you're not a child, for you shall do exactly what I intend. You shall speak exactly what I planned. Verse 8, this is probably the unspoken fear that Jeremiah even had, right? Be not afraid of their faces. Great fear was probably overwhelming him when as a young man he was set appointed to a task to preach unto all that God sent him to. He says, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. 
And it's amazing because that's a real command that I have to remind myself of often. Be not afraid of their faces. I don't know if you all do it on purpose, but sometimes you look at me strangely and I'm wondering, are they mad at me? Did I just beat up on them? Are they offended? You know what I mean? Because men just by nature make faces, right? If they get tired, whatever it is. And here he uh, deals with Jeremiah's worry. He deals with Jeremiah's concern. He worried that he would change the message of addressing a large audience and they were to look at him or scowl at him or, or change faces before them or be an affront to the message that was coming back. He says, don't be afraid of that because you have to say exactly what I want you to say. Then the Lord, now he's going to enable Jeremiah. He's going to empower Jeremiah. Put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. His ministry here is to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Jeremiah had a tough task. He had a mostly and predominantly negative message to the people that would receive it. And certainly he understood the consequence and weight and gravity of such a call. And yet God had a particular plan for the man and God was going to give him the power to do so. Ordained here specifically by God as he had promises. Set in order the plan that was set before the man that he would be a prophet to the nations. He would root out. He would pull down. He would destroy. He would throw down. But then he would build. And then he would plant. Jeremiah had that call upon his life. It is God's purpose that he had for him. And if we're sitting here today and we're not yet sure what God's purpose, what God's plan is, what God's desire, if it's unclear what he wants for each and every one of us, we need to just keep doing what God requires of his own people. And his purpose, specifically at such a time as this, is to wait and to be ready for the time when he calls. Jeremiah was called at a very young age. Some of us are called at an older age. Some of us realize the calling and we have shrugged it off and we've passed it, we've bypassed it. But God's not going to relinquish. His callings are without repentance, the Bible says. Matthew chapter 25, if you would, Matthew chapter 25. And try to speed up a little bit here. Matthew chapter 25. You're going to find the group of uh, virgins that were foolish and virgins that were wise. I'm going to read through it pretty quickly. Matthew 25 and verse 1. And then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, right? And this is us when we think that God's not ready to use us. We say God couldn't use us. God doesn't need me for any particular in ministry, any particular job. He tarries, and while they do, these that are not wise, they all slumbered and slept, right? And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for the lamps are gone out. But the wise answered and said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. The message here, particularly to believers, is you got to be ready. you got to be watching. you got to be that prepared person, and God will give a prepared place for them. The oil here, a type of the Spirit of God anointing the person, having them ready. And if you're a wise virgin in this parable, you're going to be singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. You're going to be watching unto prayer. You're going to be reading your Bible. You're going to be planning and preparing for the time when God puts that call upon your life. And yet too often we don't even get started in the process of preparing our oil and having it ready for God to step into our life and give us the task because we're too busy saying, oh, God doesn't need me. God doesn't need me. 
God doesn't need me for the labor. He doesn't need me for the work. He doesn't need me in the church. He doesn't need me for, for such and such. And just lay out the excuses as to why I could not be used of God. And the reality is, is that he is ready and has a plan for you. Are you ready to do it? Luke chapter 14 talks about another group. Luke chapter 14 talks about another group. Luke 14 and verse 15. Luke 14 and verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant to the supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Okay? And then all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oaks, and, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said unto the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring hither the poor, and bring the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and edges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And here the supper, as a Christian, you can apply that as like a reward. It's like the opportunity to sit with the Lord. It's an opportunity to labor with the Lord, to be with the Lord, to be in his fellowship, in his company. And here we see that they were misplaced or they lost their reward because they weren't prepared. They weren't ready to fulfill the calling of God when that time came. They all made excuses. Now sometimes you'll find in the Christian life and you'll find in the Bible where there literally is a last call for Christians. We know that there's a last call for the unbelievers to actually get saved and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that last call comes and they reject it for the last time, God gives them over to the reprobate mind. They get exactly what they wanted. No remembrance of God. No opportunity to fellowship with God. No opportunity to spend eternity with God. That's for the unbelievers. But for the Christians in your particular job that he has for you, sometimes I believe there is a last call. As you see, these virgins had the door shut. And they could not enter in. They could not sup with their God. The bidden men, they were simply replaced from the maimed, the poor, the blind, the halt, anybody that would come. They were compelled to come in. And when the men finally came, they said, none of you shall taste of this supper. None of you shall have this reward. They missed their call. They missed their time because they made excuse because they already had other plans. They already had other things going involved. Now, the best case would be something like people of Israel, where they went around Israel, or they went around the wilderness for another 40 years. That would have been the best case situation, right? To just have to go around and then eventually enter the promised land again 40 years later. But much suffering, much hurt, much wrong happened because of it. Yet they weren't completely cut off. They didn't have the last call and missed the reward entirely. A better thing happened for Moses, where he spent 40 more years laboring and working with his father-in-law until the time came around where he went full circle and entered into that same calling that he was originally appointed unto. A better case would have been like Jonah, who had the opportunity, the call to go and to preach into the Ninevites. And when he refused and went in the opposite direction, he spent three days and three nights in the well's belly getting vomited up and then finally said, okay, God, I'll take your call and accept it. I will go. But the reality is you have two situations and both of them really aren't pleasant to go through the chastening of the Lord, to go through the proving time with the Lord again, to say no to his calling, to say no to his opportunity, to say, hey, God doesn't need me. I'm going to get busy with this. I'm going to get busy with that. I'm going to get busy with all these other things and have many excuses. Or I'm just going to sleep and slumber and just wait it off. Maybe God will call me someday again. There's two things that can happen. Either the door is shut and that opportunity is gone. Either you're replaced and somebody else goes to the appointed work. Or you sit around and you have to go through another trying period. you got to get swallowed by a will. you got to go through some hurt and some hard things. We, don't need to rely, we can't rely on the fact that there will be another chance, though. We need to answer the call of God today. 
Now it's sure and it's certain that God does not need anything. The Bible claims that, that he, he has need of nothing. He made all things. What would he need his creation to give back to him? He is fully sustained and he has always been fully sustained since the beginning of the time. Complete in his own self. But while he doesn't need you, he certainly wants you. He has certainly called you. He has certainly appointed you to a particular task, a particular high opportunity, a lofty goal, a lofty target that only he could call for, and that only you saying, yes, I will go, would empower and complete the situation where he would then go ahead and use you. Yet too often people are forsaking the call. Too often people are refusing the call of God in their life, and look what it's doing. It's causing hurt. It's causing harm. It's causing people to be replaced. It's calling, causing co God to go and look somewhere else. It's causing just the end of a certain situation even. A great example that I've heard was that idea of end thy house. It was asked us in Guyana, well, what about that person out in the jungle, the hypothetical person that's never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, hasn't even seen white man maybe. You know, they're just, they're just out there. They've been in that state forever. They have, they, they've never known civilization. They've never known the written word. They've never had something preached unto them. Well, as we read in Jeremiah, we didn't read it, but you could go there again. The Bible at one time was preached unto all nations. In the time of Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar published before all nations, all of the world, the gospel message, the, the message of the saving God of gods, Lord of lords. That went through. Way back even further in the original Babylon, you find that though the languages were confounded, at one point they were one. And everybody would have heard the same gospel message of truth. And at one point there was just Adam and Eve who supped with God, who learned of his great salvation when he took the, um, when he took their, their skin or their, their, their fig leaves that they had sewed themselves, their own works, and set them aside and gave them the slain lamb to cover them. The gospel message there. Soon after, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. But the reality is, is that sometimes people close off the opportunity. Yeah, God doesn't need you, but God called a man at some point who is long in the lineage of that guy, that hypothetical guy out in the jungles of Africa who has never heard the word of God. At some point, back and back and back and back and back, there was somebody in that man's lineage who heard the gospel, who heard the call of God upon his life, and, and God reached out and he said, no thanks. And so this is the thing that Christians need to understand. Yeah, God doesn't need you, but even better than God needing something from Who wants a God that needs you? Who, who wants a needy God that wants you to sacrifice things, that needs you to feed him, that needs you to pick him up when his statue falls over? Who wants a God like that? Our God needs nothing. He needs, he needs nothing from us, but better than that, the God that has no need wants us has called us, has chosen us for a particular task, for a particular work, for a particular day as this. And when we refuse it, just as the virgins that didn't trim their lamps and prepare unto the Lord coming unto them. Just like here the, um, here the, uh, the, the people that were bidden to the supper but had other excuses. Here, just like Moses, as we read, how he jumped ahead of the call of God and then made excuses and then all, all these other reasons why he couldn't do the work that was placed before them. At some point in the time of these guys, they said no, and the consequence was, as it says, thou shalt be saved and thy house. If you're never saved, if you never heed the call, if you never take the command of God to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, get saved, and then go and tell others, what happens is that it's cut off. The door closes. And in the case of those, they fell into the case where the virgins had, where the door was shut. It was closed. The gospel was not going to penetrate that jungle because one man said no to the call of God. One man said no to God reaching out and wanting to get a hold of him, wanting to touch him, wanting to embrace him and to use him and empower him to do his work here on this world. So we need to think about those things. We don't want the door shut on ourselves and then on the generations that follow. We don't want somebody else to be replace us and to stand in the gap that God had us to stand in and then we lose opportunity to sup with him, to have the rewards with him. We really don't want to go through and march around the wilderness for another 40 years 
for God to only bring us back to the same decision he wanted us to make years previous. We don't want to get swallowed by a whale, okay? So we need to take it seriously, prepare ourselves unto the time when God will give you the call, when God will give you the appointment, when God will ordain you to the particular task that he had in mind before you were even formed as Jeremiah. And next time that we're called to go soul winning, next time that we're called to stop and pray, next time we're called to go and to witness to our neighbors, next time we're called to love our families, next time we're called to go to a mission trip, next time we're called to anything that God has for us, any work within the realm of his kingdom, we need to jump on board. Because if we don't, the effects can transmit and can just roll down through history. And one decision that I make to disobey God today could have me spinning in a wilderness for 40 years. It could have me, it could have me getting eaten up proverbially by the whale and going through just a mess of a situation. It could have God shut the door. It could have somebody else needed to step in and to take my place and to do the job that God had for me. But if we were to just embrace the call of God, be prepared for God to make it clear what he wants you to do. I mean, God isn't, isn't spooky. God doesn't like give you little signs like trinkets in your kitchen that just like give you a reminder to go and to do certain things. No, God will be very clear. He was clear with Jeremiah, wasn't he? He was clear with Moses, wasn't he? He said, you are going to go and you're to preach what I say to you and to all nations. Done. He just, he just laid it out. And this is the same thing that God will do to us. And hasn't he? Isn't there so many commands in scriptures? We don't need to get some we don't need to get some mystical calling with a burning bush anymore. Hey, we have the story of the burning bush. And what did that teach us? It teaches us to walk toward ten commandments that condemned us to hell, but to take the salvation story that would cleanse us of the commandments that were condemning us, and then God says, Go ye and tell all the world. So there isn't no mystery about what God has for us, but there certainly is a calling before us. There certainly is an opportunity to receive reward, and there certainly is an opportunity to bless nations, bless kindred, bless family from years to come simply by your obedience. But as it always is, there's a blessing and a curse. Obey God, blessing. Disobey, you could be cursing not just yourself, but your children, your children's children. And next thing you know, 15 generations down, your children are the ones that people are talking about, saying, well, hey, what about those people in Canada? that just have never heard the gospel. You know, it seems strange, but that it would have seemed a strange thought to the guy in that jungle that rejected the missionary, that rejected the message coming down from Sinai, that rejected wherever, at whatever point in history. It would have been strange to him, like, ah, I don't need that right now. I'm busy, I got things going on, right? And he wouldn't have thought that his posterity for years and years and years would be now sitting deep in a dark jungle with the door shut upon him. Because he made the decision not to go, not to he, not to take God's calling seriously. Yeah, God doesn't need us, okay? God doesn't need anything. But what he does have is better. He has an appropriate calling for people that he needs, he desires, he wants more than anything to get involved in a situation. He, he wants us to take his command seriously, to take his word and to spread it abroad into all nations. And that is what God wants, desires from the bottom of his heart more than anything, is that his people would love him and the love would be spread abroad. Take it seriously, Christians. Prepare. God has a specific job for you. Don't be the one that cuts off the voice of God into generations to come to life. Don't be the one that stops and says, no, I'm, I'm too busy for that. Don't be the one that shuts the door to nations after. Don't be the one that loses the chance to have a reward and to sup with God and to embrace living and being and breathing and just have good fellowship with the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. You don't want any of that. You don't want to get swallowed by a whale. All right, Heavenly Father,